Hello, this is Robin Barnes, the songbird of New Orleans. Welcome to the 19th annual Sachimo Summerfest presented by Chevron and the Hilton Sachimo Legacy Stage. This event is produced by French Quarter Festivals Incorporated, a nonprofit organization showcasing New Orleans culture and heritage since 1984. This event is made possible through the sponsorship of community minded organizations and the sale of Avita, Jack Daniels, Sonoma Couture, Corbell, Tequila Heradora. Finlandia, Pepsi, Aquafina, Bubbly, Bayou Rum, French Market Cold Brew, Louisiana Iced Tea, and Festival Merchandise, which helps pay for great entertainment, security, sanitation, recycling, EMS, and production costs. Please support your festival by purchasing from our beverage and merchandise booths. Do your part to keep the festival clean by using recycling and trash containers on site. And support our recycling effort by purchasing a reusable souvenir cup at our beer and cocktail booths. And please, enjoy responsibly. Special thanks to the Satchimo Legacy Stage contributors. Hilton, Harris, New Orleans, Joseph K. and Inez Eichenbaum Foundation, Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation, Barbershop Harmony Society, The Fertel Foundation, Richie and Vicky Norigian, and Andrea Duplessis. And thank you to all sponsors, including Chevron, Brown Foreman, Abita Brewing Company, GE, Fidelity Bank, WWL TV, Offbeat Magazine, and so many more. Pick up a schedule for a full listing of all performances, events, and the culinary lineup. Go grab a bite before the next act begins, and stop by the merchandise tent to purchase the official Satchmo Summerfest poster, shirts, and souvenirs. Enjoy the 19th annual Satchmo Summerfest presented by Chevron, and happy birthday, Louis Armstrong. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for, be, for your patience and thank you for our, our noble friends for making adjustments in our schedule. Before we begin, please turn your cell phones off. Good idea. I see a couple of people reaching. We'll, we'll be patient with them. In the meantime, make some noise for Sally Young and Dean O. Osanto. Hey, how y'all doing? Are we on? Yeah, there it is. Um, I want to give you an introduction. First and foremost, we're going to do a talk on the Asanto Dukes of Dixieland. I've got Dino Asanto here today. Yay! Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> he's the son of the founder, one of the founders of the Dukes of Dixieland, Frank Asanto. And he's here today to share some pictures, articles, music, and family stories. He's got lots of them. So again, give him a big round. Thank you. Thank you and very we're much. Here. We're glad you're here. We're glad you made it through the rain and got in the building and enjoyed Louis and the Asanto Dukes. So first of all, Dino, do you want to give us a, an introduction to just who are the Asanto Dukes uh, uh, Yeah, my father was Frank Asanto and his brother was Freddie Asanto. And you can see him in this picture here. And then in the middle there is their father, Papa Jack Asanto. Uh, they created the Dukes of Dixieland, not Papa Jack as much as the two sons did. And that was approximately 1950. Um, uh, to be honest with you, here's the start of this, I guess, is that it was, I guess, inevitable that Louis would end up playing with the Dukes eventually, the Asanto family eventually, because um, the Asantos have been playing music in the city of New Orleans now for over 100 years, and that dates back to uh, 1900, and that was with uh, Federico Asanto in 1900. And Federico had two sons, and his oldest son, his name was Anthony Jacinto, and he was born in 1905, and, um, excuse me, in 1905. And obviously, that was just a few years after Lewis was born. And, um, let me see if we get this thing to hold up. And 1905, excuse me. Anyway, so Anthony Jacinto, by the time Anthony was uh, 20 years old, he was playing right down the street here at the Orpheum Theater um, at the, in the pit with the orchestra. And by the time 1948 came around, he became the first musical director and professor of music at Redemptorist High School. Uh, at that time, he became known as Papa Jack Asanto. And Papa Jack had two sons, and one was Freddie, the oldest, and Frank was the second son. And by the time they hit their early teens, they were already playing uh, jazz in the city. And so they started very young. 
And by the time they hit 50, 1950 rolled around, which made Freddie had just turned 20 years old and Frank had just turned 18 years old, they created the band called the Dukes of Dixieland. And within a few years, I'd say le less than seven, six to seven years, they found themselves playing on stage and recording with and also performing on different TV shows along with Louis Armstrong. Um, and our fifth generation, the generation that's now playing music here in the city is Frank Asanto's granddaughter. And she, her name is Lexi Asanto, and she leads a band called the Asanto Dukes, a Dixieland tribute. Now, they play the music of the 1950s original Dukes of Dixieland. Um, she's a featured vocalist, obviously. Um, now, you're going to hear me refer to the band as we go through the day today as just the Dukes. It'll, I'll make, call them the Asanto Dukes. I may also call them the original Dukes or even the real Dukes. And the reason for that is that there is a band here in the city that uses the name Dukes of Dixieland, the band name that they created, which obviously created many issues for us. And uh, those issues were addressed to the courts and very favorably, they concluded in our behalf. And most, most favorably, I say for us, is that that band, using the name now, has no historical connection whatsoever to the Asanto family or the Asanto Dukes or the original Dukes. So that's a little background on just who the Asantos are. And now the, the rest of this you know, presentation, we'll be showing pictures and, like Sally just said, some recordings of Lewis. And best of all, I'll be able to share a few stories that uh, Betty had told me, and I'll tell you who Betty is in a few minutes. Okay. Well, who's in this photo? Okay. Well, this, this photo is, this photo is uh, <laughs> uh, obviously, this photo is from 1955. Uh, obviously, you can, it's from up in Chicago, and obviously you can see that that's Louis Armstrong to the right and the center. And, and by the way, that person on the far right and the bottom, in case you don't know it for sure, because he has hair, uh, that is Pete Fountain. Uh, Pete Fountain got his start with the, the Asanto brothers in the late 40s when they were still in high school. Um, the lady, the young lady in the middle there, uh, her name is Betty, and her maiden name was Betty Owens. Uh, originally, she was from originally she was from uh, La, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and as a child, at the age of nine years old, she was a hillbilly singer. Now, don't be confused with hillbilly with country, because she scolded me one day for calling her a country singer. This hillbilly obviously is completely different. <laughs> so, uh, she, so she uh, she started singing, like I said, in Baton Rouge as a hillbilly singer, and she was known to sing on stage in the in the 40s with then Governor Jimmy Davis of "You Are My Sunshine" fame. So she would know, you know, knew Governor Jimmy Davis and sang with him as a child. When she was approximately 15 years old, she moved to New Orleans with her family, and she crossed paths with Freddie. Uh, Freddie was marching in a Mardi Gras parade. And, well, she befriended Freddie, her and her friend, and the next thing you know is Betty's singing jazz. And she was also started to date Freddie. So this picture being in 1955, approximately, that gave her five years of being with the family. And around this same time, she married Freddie, and that was what made her another Asanto in the family. So that you had Freddie and Frank and Betty in the band, and they called her the Duchess. So you had the Dukes of Dixieland with the Duchess. And by this time, they had already been around uh, Louis Armstrong once or twice in 1950. They were introduced by Joe Delaney, who was the manager of the Dukes at the time. Now, Frank was very young at 18 years old, and Louis was obviously his idol. So at, in 1950, he obviously was very much in, you know, thrilled to meet Louis finally. Well, you were just talking about Betty the Duchess, and I know that she toured with the band and also traveled when they were touring, well, playing gigs with Lewis. You got any stories about yes, that? Yes. Well, <laughs> as a matter of fact, this picture is one of the pictures that she and I would talk about. She and uh, Betty, well, I called her my Aunt Betty because she could be nobody else's Aunt Betty. And she, um, she and I were very close, and this particular picture, she tells me a story one day, and she, you know, Betty was very animated. She was a very animated person, and she tells to me, she says, Dino, you never can believe this, what happened. One day we were playing a gig, and Lewis was on the same venue, and uh, she said she was in her dressing room with Freddie, and Freddie looked at her and said, Betty, would you go down and go knock on Lewis's door and tell Lewis that he's about to go on, you know? So you got to figure, she's 21, 22 at best, right? Lewis is the age of her grand, her father-in-law, Papa Jack. So she says, okay, no problem. So she walks down the hallway, knocks on the door, and Lewis says, come on in. So, you know, the young girl says, okay, I'll open the door. She opens the door, and she looks at me with her bright eyes, and I said, what? And she says, he was standing in the room, butt-ass naked. And I said, <laughs> what? And I said, she goes, she goes, he was naked, Dino, standing. I said, well, Aunt Betty, what did you do? 
She says, well, I slammed the door, turned around, ran down the hallway to Freddie and told, your, told Uncle Freddie, your Uncle Freddie. I said, well, what did Uncle Freddie say? He, well, he thought it was funny. He's, and I'm like, geez, and Pete, that's a heck of a story. You know? So we laughed about it. She says, Dino, that's not the end of it. I said, okay, what else? Well, she says the next day she goes into the, her dressing room and Freddie and my dad Frank were in there talking and Frank looks at Betty and says, look, stroll down the hallway and go tell Lewis he's about to go on. Well, that's, Betty's response was, I'm not doing it. And I said, I said, Aunt Betty, you didn't do it? She says, I wasn't going to do that again. Dino, I'm not falling for that again. I said, okay. I said, she goes, well, your dad convinced me. Your dad said, Betty, please, it's no big deal. Just go down and tell Lewis. Okay, so, so she strolls down the hallway again, knocks on the door, and then she looks at me and she wags her finger. Now, this is many years later. She wags her finger and she says, I wasn't going to fall for it again. So I knocked on the door, and Lewis this time says, who is it? She says, it's the Duchess. And he says, come on in. So then she looks at me bright-eyed and says, Lewis, are you dressed? Of course, come on in. Well, she opens the door and he's butt-ass naked again. <laughs> okay, and by the way, I said, I'm going to Aunt Betty. I said, you gotta be kidding me. She says, no. I said, what did you do this time? She goes, she goes I screeched, turned around, and the boys, she used to call Frank and Freddie, the boys. She says, the boys are running down the hallway laughing their rear ends off. Obviously, this was a setup. And so I told her, I asked her, you know, when we were talking, I said, well, what did you do after that, Aunt Betty? She said, I never went to Lewis's dressing room ever again, number one. <laughs> and number two is, Dino, I swear to this day, I cannot get that vision out of my mind. <laughs> Every time Lewis comes on the radio, anytime I see him on any, I, all I see is a naked Lewis Armstrong. And she, <laughs> so obviously it was funny for her to have to deal with that. So, on that note. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that one up. <laughs> We've got a quote. This well, is from, from Louis Armstrong in his own words. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I don't know if you want to read this. or. Yeah, I guess I can read it. It might be easier to if I read it. This is, uh, like Sally just said, it's a quote from Louis Armstrong. Um, obviously, Louis felt very comfortable with Frank and Freddie and Betty and Papa Jack. Obviously, the Italian family played the same music. They're from the hometown, very comfortable. So whenever they got a chance to play together, they would. So here's what Louis writes in his own words. The Dukes of Dixieland, whom I think was the youngest group to leave New Orleans, was the first white group, white band, excuse me, white band whom me and my band played at the same time with, stage with, which was a great thrill to me. It was the New Orleans Auditorium. We played for, uh, for a big concert there. I did not see the Dukes again until they came up north. I sat in with them when they played at the nightclub in Chicago. In New York, I made quite a few fine albums with them. They also were sensa sensational from the first day they left New Orleans. I did TV shows with them, played at Walt Disney's, played Disneyland, etc. They are still going strong, so you can see how happy I am to have know that I finally had a chance to blow with white boys at last in my, in my hometown of New Orleans. About time, huh? So to me, the Dukes of, the, the Dukes of Dixieland broke the ice. One of the men said to me while we were on stage, Satch, today we got New Orleans jazz in black and white. Very nice. Okay, All right. Here's the USSR. Tool. Okay, uh, the USSR. Obviously, this is an article that was written in 1959, and it's um, announcing that Satchmo and the Dukes were going to go to the USSR and do a tour there, but it never did happen. Um, for some reason, I think he had State Department government issues, as usual. Uh, so that didn't happen. But what's interesting about this is that it introduces two people into the fray. Um, and one of them is Joe Glazer. Uh, we'll actually, I'll go with Sid Fry first. Sid Fry was the owner operator of Audio Fidelity Records. Um, he had the first recording in high fidelity and also the first recording in stereo. Um, he was very much a go-getter, and at the same time, Joe Glazer owned and operated a, the big, probably the premier uh, booking agency in the country, which was ABC Promotions. And they, he had everybody on their list of roster, his roster list, which I think we'll show you in a minute. But this circle that the Dukes fell into at the time, and it obviously included Lewis, because you know Lewis met him in 1950. By this time, you're talking about 1959. They were on stage in Chicago in 1955. And in the, throughout 1957 and 58, they did many TV shows, which uh, Ricky has showed you some of those same jazz hours and Timex shows and things like that. The Dukes were on a lot of those also with Lewis. Yeah, and here's up next. This is a roster of the ABC group, the uh, Associated Booking 
Corporation. And if you see, uh, Louis Armstrong is on top, probably their biggest grossing artist at the time. But if you go down, if you scroll down on that column, the same first column, there's the Dukes of Dixieland. Yeah, lo- uh, point yeah. out some other names. Oh, yeah, it? there's a bunch. If you can, probably be better to see it over there. I'm not sure. If, I can't really read them, but I know that you've got anywhere from Al Hurt to Pete Fountain's band. You got Sarah Vaughn. You got Duke Ellington. I mean, the list just goes on. So these people are obviously all in the same circle, and a lot of them are a lot older than Frank and Freddie were. Like I said, they were just out of their teens in their early 20s uh, when they got to do all these things with Lewis, and obviously Lewis was in his 50s by this, by this time. Okay, here's another article. This is from March of 1977. It's in a publication called the Mississippi Rag. Yeah, well, this this uh, publication has a few significant parts in it. Obviously, you can't read it, um, but uh, it introduces where it says where Joe, where the Frank and Freddie and Betty first met Louis Armstrong, which was in 1950. Like I said before, it was Joe Delaney who did that. And Joe Delaney was the manager of the Dukes of Dixieland. Now, most people think, you know, you got a band manager. That band manager is some old guy who's been doing it for 40 years. Uh, no, Joe Delaney was a first-time, first-year law student at Tulane University in 1949, and the same year Freddie had enrolled in, to go to college to become a lawyer. Well, God help us. And um, so it, it didn't last, trust me. Freddie got out of the law student. He was out of that in the first semester, but Joe Delaney stayed on. He became manager, stayed manager for over 20, almost 20 years. And he was the one that knew that Lewis was playing at the Municipal Auditorium in 1950, and Frank, Freddie, and Betty the Duchess, they were playing at the uh, famous door, so he dragged them over there, introduced them to Lewis. So that way, obviously, years later, Lewis you know, remembered those times that they got together in those early years. Okay, here's a better picture. This is the Louis and the Dukes of Dixieland cover. Okay, yeah. Well, this refers, actually, this picture here is the authorized legitimate re- release on audio fidelity of the Lewis and the Dukes recordings that were done. This recording was made up in, uh, at Webster Hall in, in New York. That article that just we just went through with the Joe Delaney thing issue, uh, in that article it talks about the outtake recordings. And the outtake recordings were recorded in, at the Oriental Theater up in Chicago in 1959. And, um, what happened there was, and Joe Delaney, I knew him until he died, and that was in the early 90s. He was like 92 years old when he passed away. So I knew him all the way to the end of his life, and he told me this story, and it matches up with that article. Uh, what happened was they were scheduled to do two albums on Audio Fidelity's label. And what happened was that Louis was supposed to do one with his All-Stars and one with the Dukes of Dixieland. Well, the, the sessions were held on August 3rd, 4th, and 5th of 1959 up in Chicago. Well, the Oriental Theater was very boomy sound, and it did not have the quality sound that Sid Fry really wanted and always you know, expected in his recordings. So he came back in t- to listen to the recordings, and when he did, he didn't like the way they sounded. They sounded terrible to him. He, couldn't, you know, he said, this is not the quality I want to put out. And at the same time, since Louis was a DECA artist, he, DECA people came in and said, wait a minute, where did you get this list of tunes from? You got the tunes mixed up. What happened was the secretary or whoever was in charge of telling them which tunes to play on which albums or which, you know, which group was going to play which tunes had, had switched them up. And by doing so, DECA was not happy. So DECA says, let's throw these things away and we'll redo the recording. And that was this album that they did in, Chicago, up in uh, New York. Um, but in the music business, anybody knows this, they never throw anything away. I mean, they kept those things. They say they trash them. They don't trash anything, trust me. They come out 30, 40 years later, you know. So, but that's just the way. That's a little story behind the outtakes. And you're going to hear a couple of snippets of those outtake recordings in just a little while, I think. Do you want to hear one now? Well, wow, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> like magic. Do you want to hear? You want to tell them yeah, uh, this set up is, Wolverine this, Blues for us? Yeah, this is, uh, this is Wolverine Blues. And before we, before we do this, let me um, say something. Sally and I, obviously, you know, we been talking about doing this presentation, it was, I'll give Sally the credit for this. She looks at me and she says, wait, when was the recording made with this recording? I said, well, these recordings were made August 3rd, 4th, and 5th of 1959. And she says to me, do you realize what date we're doing our presentation? I said, August 3rd, 2019. She says, that's 60 years to the day. Now, so you're sitting here listening to the tune that's 60 years to the day of the recordings actually made. Now, after we hear this recording, I uh, guess I'm going to share another little tidbit, but we'll, let's listen to some of the recording there.
Okay, now that sounds, it almost sounds like these guys have been playing forever, correct? I mean, you listen to this. Um, and I failed to tell you this, I should have probably said it, you saw the pictures at the beginning. Uh, my father was Frank, like I said, he played trumpet. Louis was his idol, obviously. Uh, my Uncle Freddie, he played the trombone, and Papa Jack, and as you see him in this picture, he's playing banjo in the background. Uh, he had played banjo, and he also played uh, trombone also. So, and obviously we know what Louis played. Now, there's a little bit of a story behind that same uh, recording session up in the Oriental Theater. My brother, J Frank Jr., told me this story uh, many years ago, and then it was reinforced by somebody years later, another musician friend. Um, and it's kind of a funny story now, I guess, but when Lewis went into the, into the Oriental Theater to see, about, you know, to get these things off the ground recording-wise, uh, he walks in and looking around, now remember, he already knew my father and he already knew the family, so it wasn't nothing new. He walks in and he's looking around and he says, where's that little white boy? Where's that little white trumpet player at? And they point to the bathroom. My dad's in the bathroom. And Lewis goes into the bathroom and tells my dad, now this is the first time they're recording together. He tells my dad, Frank, if you're going to record with me, you got to smoke this. So this was the first time my dad smoked what pot. It was with Louis Armstrong <laughs> in the bathroom at the Oriental Theater. Now, I, I've always wondered, and, I'll, and I don't think I've said this to too many people, I've always wondered, well, what did Papa Jack think about that? I mean, where was his dad? Was you know, he was sneaking around smoking pot with Louis Armstrong, okay? So. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> and here's Sid Fry at the, uh, the uh, high-tech console. Yeah, this, uh, I, I don't know, and I'll be honest, I, this, I'm just going to guess this might be Webster Hall up in uh, New York. I'm not really sure. Uh, this picture is a little bit poignant because Sid Fry was an, uh, a pioneer in the recording industry. He actually was the first to record, like I may have said before, in high fidelity. Uh, you know, you had mono, and then you went to high fidelity, and then you went to stereo. And obviously stereo is still is where it's at in, in the recording business. Um, and so being the first to record in high fidelity, and then the first to record in stereo, he featured both of those recordings with the Dukes of Dixieland. So now, all of a sudden, he finds himself in a prominent spot with having had Louis Armstrong record for him with the Dukes. So he kind of put the whole package together in, you know, in his history, I would say. Now, he didn't pay... Uh, pennies for Lewis, don't get me wrong. He paid a lot of money to do those recordings with Lewis. If I'm not mistaken, he shelled out $40,000. Now, you talk 1949, so you can put the math on it. You can imagine how much that would be today you know, to do those recordings. Okay, so we're on to the, uh, the Timex broadcast. All right, the Dukes and Lewis were on a few different shows. You, you and I sat there and watched a few of them together. Um, and they, you know, they... they how do I say this? They never played on the stage at the same time in these sh during these shows. But uh, my Uncle Freddie was probably, and I, of course, I'm a very biased person, uh, a premier tailgate trombonist, okay? He, he was the man that in that era that was Mr. Tailgate. And so what you're going to see here is a little bit of snippet with John Cameron Swayze. If you have your watches, you know what I'm, who I'm talking about. Um, it's from uh, 1959, I think. I think it's uh, January 7th, 1959, if I'm not mistaken. And you just take a, take a look, and Lewis makes a comment and, about him with Jackie Gleason, who's the, the MC of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, a good evening to you. This is John Cameron Swayze for Timex Watches, speaking to you live, I'm glad to report, from Broadway, the fabulous Great White Way, where uh, inside this theater, there is starting one of television's most exciting events, the Timex All-Star Jazz Show. And during the evening, we'll have some astounding news about Timex watches for you. So be sure and stick around for that. But right now, let's all go inside for jazz. Good evening, and welcome to the golden age of jazz. Yeah, we, Jack we love Lee. the way they use stencil letters on television. To be Isn't here it? on the Timex All-Star Jazz Show. Surrounded by the greatest bunch of jazz musicians ever assembled on one television program. These are the giants of jazz. There's Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington and his full band, Dizzy Gillespie, George Sheary, the Dukes of Dixieland, Gene Cooper and Joe Jones, Roy Elders and Bobby Hackett, Coleman Hawkins and Big Dickie. Marty Napoleon, and the girl, Dakota State, and Ruth O'Leary, and Barbara Day. 
Martin, and that would be Freddie. Coming into the scene, also he ends up playing again. Listen to what this talk about here. That was the Dukes of Dixieland. Lewis is playing. great. Slide, frog, slide. <laughs> Say, listen, uh, wasn't that that uh, tailgate trombone that that guy was playing? Yeah, but, uh, let me tell you about that tailgate trombone. Yeah. Uh, you know, down in New Orleans, where we used to play, sitting in those old wagons, well, we used to always make the trombone player sit out on the tailgate. So that cat could have a lot of room to make him slide like that. Yeah. yeah. He wouldn't hit the side. No, I mean, so soon everybody began calling, uh, calling the cat, uh, tailgate trombone, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah and the name stuff. And you, that boy over there, Duke. Duke, Duke. You mean the guy that played the trombone? He, he plays the real They all play that kind of stuff on the way to cemeteries and funerals. Yeah, and he plays the real good. You know the way they played it? It must have been a pleasure to die. Oh, that's my man. I died once in some day. Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah. You see Papa Jack also playing with his sons, okay, in the dark jacket. He always wore something different because he's, he was a special guest of the group of the Dukes when he, ever, he would perform. Um, so I think the next thing we're going to play here, or do for y'all, share with y'all, is another version of many, as many versions they have out there of a song called Bourbon Street Parade. Uh, Bourbon Street Parade was written by Paul Barberin in the late, early 1950s, and the first band to record it and play it was the Dukes of Dixieland. Uh, Paul knew that they were up and coming, and he obviously, you know, thought that this would be a good way to profile his new song called Bourbon Street Parade. Um, you're going to hear a, a version of the, from the outtakes from 1959. I, mean, I don't know if my dad was still stoned or not, but he damn so, he sounds really good when he's singing with Lewis. You would think that they had sung together all their lives together. Uh, take a listen to this and you'll hear it. You know what I mean. city is pretty historic scenes I'll take you parade you down Bourbon Street there are lots of hot spots you'll see all the big shots down on Bourbon Street yeah let's fly down or no, drive that's down right. to that city, it sure is pretty, historic scene, I'm gonna take you out, I'll even parade you, down Bourbon Street, well now there are a lot of hot spots, you're gonna see some big shots, down on Bourbon Street, one more, one more, one more, one more game, 
Let's fly down. Oh, yes. Or drive down. Mm, yeah. To New Orleans. <laughs> well, that city. Yeah, man. It sure's pretty. Yeah. Historic city. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonna take you. <laughs> I'd like to parade you. Yes, indeed. Down on Bourbon Street. <laughs> Mama, the Dutch is in. Not a lot of hot spots. Ooh. We're gonna see all the big shots. Tell about it. Down on Bourbon Street. Yeah, man. <laughs> Now, as my dad would say, ain't that damn purdy? <laughs> he said that at Carnegie Hall in an album, so I had to use it. I'm sorry. He's not gonna he's not gonna sue me for plagiarism, I don't think. But you would think they sat there, the way they interact like that, you would think they would have played together. And the whole series of recordings on those outtakes, Louis does the same thing, my dad back and forth. They do a great version of Sweethearts on Parade. It's a five minute version of it that would just knock your socks off. But we had to pick and choose since we had so much material. Maybe next year we'll do that. Yeah, why not? Let's go to Let's the go to uh, Oriental Theater. Oh, yeah. Well, these recordings were made at the Oriental Theater, and these pictures that are coming out, um, I would say almost nobody's seen them. This is the first time they're publicly being shown, and there's a, there's about uh, about eight or ten of them here, I think. Uh, this collection came from my grandfather's slideshow when he left to me when he, before he died. I would say after he died, but he couldn't do that. Um, so he left me a slideshow, and if people don't know nowadays what slides are, the little tiny transparencies you put on a projector, okay? It's not like we have nowadays, but anyway, there are slides. Uh, here you see to the far left is Freddie, obviously Frank and Lewis, and then the far right here, mm -hmm. I'm gonna bring Jerry Fuller up, that's his name. Um, Jerry Fuller was probably the last living original Dukes of Dixieland member. He just died this past June 24th, and I remember him as a child, and he was just the most pleasant man in the world. Um, it seemed like the Dukes always surrounded themselves with great people, such as Lewis and men like Jerry Fuller. Very talented, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know what Lewis is saying, but it's got to be good. Okay, it looks like on the tuba back there, it looks like Rich Matheson. And on the drums to the left, you can barely see his face, that would be Mo Mahoney. And then the gentleman in the blue shirt is Lewis, obviously. And then that's my father, uh, Frank Asanto, on the right. And then here they are again. Obviously, Frank is looking at his idol, Lewis Play. And that's probably why those recordings came out. If you look at this, this is not a studio that they're in. It's an open-air room. And even though you just heard that Bourbon Street Parade, to me, that sounded fine, I guess. But if you're a studiophile person, you know, you're going to say that did not sound fine. So that's why Audio Silk Fry wanted to redo them. But, and then that's Jerry Fuller sitting in the background, too. No, uh, <laughs> this is one of my all-time favorites. I mean, I, I don't know how much larger Lewis's mouth can get, and I don't know why he's getting pinched, but it's probably, Sid, that's Sid Fry to the right, pinched him, by the way. He's probably wanting a receipt for the check for the 40 grand he gave him. But uh, obviously, they're joking around, having a good time at the theater during the, you know, during the recording session. Yeah, and if you want to notice, I, I could see sweat on Lewis's shirt, right? It, it is uh, the neckline. They're working hard, they're playing hard anyway. Okay, and I know some people dropped in. Any, anywhere Lewis went, the crowd followed, right? Oh, it's, it seemed like these recording sessions, I mean, I always thought a recording session, you know, like just the band and the engineers, that's it. Or you know, if you had sound, you know, other musicians that were going to sit in on certain tra tracks, but that's not the case. So here you got a picture. Obviously, they're listening to some of the recordings that they just recorded. And there's Lewis. Looks like he's got a soda pop in his hand. And there's Sid Fry and intently listening. Uh, my father, Frank, with the glasses, sitting bound in the background. Um, and the man with his hand to his face, cut off halfway, that's Stanley Mendelssohn. He was a, a keyboard player with the Dukes. They called him Stanley Happy Mendelssohn. He was a great ragtime piano player. And then the person standing dead center with a nice outfit is Gene Krupa. Now, I know Gene didn't record on that recording, so he must have been there just to hang out with the guys, you know. Yeah, and there were some other visitors, too. Yeah, there's, here's another one. It's obviously Lewis. I don't know who the lady is because she photobombed, I think. Um, <laughs> and that would be Dizzy Gillespie and then, obviously, again, Gene Krupa. So they all came out to the studio. Now, probably, you know, giving kudos to, to, to Lewis. If somebody said Lewis is in town, obviously they all came. You know, they wanted to see Lewis and, you know, be part of everything that Lewis was about. 
Now this one, I, again, Lewis must have really loved to tell jokes or something because I think my dad's dentures were about to fall out of his head. <laughs> I mean, he's got a whale of a laugh going on. His arms are slumped down, but that's my dad with Lewis telling him something, and then that's Stanley Mendelson to the right again in the striped shirt. Uh, the other gentleman, I can't fathom who he is. I don't, really don't know who he is. I'm, I'm going to guess it's probably a DECA executive because he's got a tie on. You know, who wears a tie to the recording studio? My dad, maybe that's why they're laughing at the guy with the tie. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, th this is a good one here. Okay, obviously that's Lewis, and somebody must have said something to, over his left shoulder, so he's going to respond to it. Then again, that's the same fellow with his hand in his pocket, not sure who he is. But then next to him with a tie half undone, that's Sid Fry. And then you've heard me talk about Joe Delaney. Okay, well that's Joe Delaney on the far left with the, the beard and the dark, uh, I guess, sweater with the light colored pants on. And like I said, he was a driving force for the Dukes uh, as far as getting them into places and meeting people and, and getting on television. And they did every television show that Lewis ever did, and probably some other ones that he didn't do. So, but Joe Delaney was a big, big, big time force in the Dukes. Okay, here's a nice family photo. Yeah. Well, this is the only photo I actually have of my grandfather, Papa Jack, with Louis Armstrong, and it's obviously a posed photo. It was never used for a promotional thing. I think it was just a family type of photo that they took, which I have, like I said, it's one of my favorite pictures of them. Yeah, one of my favorite parts of this whole story is that Louis was not only a recording artist performing and recording with the Dukes, but also a family friend, as you're going to see uh, from some uh, home, home pictures from uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, here we go, yeah. All right, this is Las Vegas. Um, I'll start from the left, well, the left bottom corner, the little girl in the blue shirt that's looking down. Uh, that's my older sister, Gina, and the lady in the peach outfit standing up, and you gotta look at her shoes. I mean, those are some cool looking shoes. I'm not a shoe guy. But anyway, the, and that's my mother. That's Joan Asanto, Joan Bartet Asanto, and she was a Miss New Orleans beauty queen in the early 1950s. Uh, she was talking to somebody, I guess, I'm not sure who it is, and then you got, I got uh, Lucille sitting down behind Frank, my dad, who's looking at Lewis. And then the man with the cigarette in his mouth is my uncle Dick Conan. You know, he's my dad's brother-in-law. Now, if you, if you look at Lewis here, he's telling Fred, Frank something. And I'm not sure what it is, but it goes back to another Betty story. Okay? All right. Here's, Betty told me, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase this for you. I think Louis probably telling Frank, I need a Swiss Chris. My stomach is killing me. Okay? <laughs> So this Betty story <laughs> is really kind of funny. They were playing in Las Vegas, and obviously it was late one night, and they were at a hotel, and the girls, that would be Betty and my mother Joan, were walking through the lobby trying to find some place or something to eat somewhere. And then, you know, it's Las Vegas in 1957 or 58. is not the Vegas it is now where you can eat anywhere all the time. So they were looking for something to eat, and they, they walked out onto the strip, and there was nothing open, nothing they could see. So they came back in, and they came across Lewis. Lewis was doing the same thing, looking for something to eat. And it was, you know, it must have been late in the evening. So I asked Betty, I said, well, what did y'all do? And she says, well, just as Lewis came out, and he was with obviously some other people, they, the cook comes out of the back of the, in the lobby of the hotel and asks them all, what, what's going on? What are y'all doing? And they said, we're looking for something to eat. And the cook says, well, look, y'all come back in the kitchen. I'll round you up something. I'll make some food for y'all. You know, because he's got Louis Armstrong, the famous Dukes of Dixieland, wives and stuff. So they go back in the kitchen. She says, they put, Betty tells me, they put a whole spread of food out, like an Asian buffet for him. They're eating it and everything, having a good old time. And now keep in mind, you're still talking about two girls that are like now 25 or 26. You already had the naked Louis trip thing go. So Louis, at the end of the meal, they all get ready to go back to their own little rooms or whatever, and Louis reaches in his pocket and he hands Betty and Joan, my mom, two little packets. And he said, look, girls, take these things. It'll make you feel better in the morning. You'll, you'll sleep well, you'll settle your stomach down. Well, all I can say is that Betty said, Dino, I said, well, I'll tell you exactly what she said. I said, hey, Betty, what happened? She said, well, the next morning, your mom and I were fighting over that Bacausa. Now, for, for those of you who don't know what a Bacauser is, that's a toilet, okay? I guess a Bacauser is hillbilly for toilet. Uh, she said that toilet ran all day long. And so when the boys came in later and they said, what are y'all doing? What's going on here? And they told Frank and Freddie, their husbands, what happened. They, the boys just shook their head and said, y'all will never learn. You're just never going to learn, are you? So <laughs> that's my only laxative story, trust me. Good old Swiss Chris. <laughs> 
Okay, and here we've got Lucille Armstrong sitting on the floor. I can't believe this guy didn't give up her chair for her, but anyway, <laughs> that's another story, no, right? She, no, her, she was probably more comfortable so she could play yeah, with the been, kids, but... you know? Yeah, she's sitting there looking down the hallway, okay? And you look down the hallway, there's a little kid back there playing a, 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 a mini trombone of sorts, and that is Mike Asanto. That would be my cousin, Mike, and he is Freddie and Frank's only child, and obviously he's... A, I mean, excuse me, Freddie. Listen to me. Oh, that'd be weird. Um, <laughs> Freddie and Betty, excuse me. Thank you from the <laughs> Can't family. Can't get over the laxative thing. Um, yeah, so that's their only son, Mike Asanto. Um, and then there's my sister, Gina, with the little red, little red shoes on, looking back at Mike saying, you know, you're taking up all the airspace. And then obviously Louis telling something to my father, and my father's intently looking at him, and I, and I don't know who the other fellow is. But this is at our home in Las Vegas. And Louis was, came quite a few times to our home, and I remember Betty telling me, she said, I said, well, how was it? And she said, well, you know, we had a lot of famous people come to the house, and Louis was obviously one of the ma major ones. And like Liberace used to come over and things like that back in the 50s um, and the early 60s, that, for that matter. But she said, no, when Louis came, we had to have a pot of red beans on the stove. I said, you cooked the pot? She goes, there was no way he was going to walk in that house. Even if he didn't want to eat it, he just wanted to smell them. You know? So here he is in Las Vegas eating like he was back in New Orleans with our New Orleans family in Vegas. There you go. How many people in here can say they had Louis Armstrong in their living room? Amazing. I can. Okay, yes, Louis. <laughs> Louis with the kids. Yeah, you can. Well, I, can. <laughs> well, so I can say it to somebody else here, too. Two people. Uh, two now, now, this, picture is, um, this picture is all of the Asunto children except for one. The only one that's not there is the one that wasn't born yet, so I guess that's impossible. Uh, but I'll tell you who they are. From the left, standing on the left with his arm draped over the little girl in front of him, that's Mike, the trombone player in the hallway you just saw. And then the person he's got his arm around or over is his sister, Jan. Uh, and Jan is standing right here. So it's, <laughs> and Betty would be her mother, and that would be the Duchess. Um, and then they got the little baby that's reaching over to the other one. That's my cousin, Carrie. And Lewis is looking down at that, um, the little boy in front of her. She's reaching for That is my younger brother, Joseph. And then the one standing, the boy standing on the far right with his mouth wide open looks like, I don't know what he looks like. But anyway, that's my older brother, Frank Jr. And then that's my sister, Gina Marie, with her hand in her mouth. And then I'm the one with the attention deficit disorder <laughs> that will not look at the camera. That's me. Oh, you're looking at Lewis. Well, well yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the star of the room. <laughs> Who else to look at? Okay. All right. Well, this is the same Motley crew that we just saw. But this, I, actually, this is a better picture of everybody, and still, I it's still have an organized. attention deficit disorder issue. Um, but I think. Well, yeah, he's reaching for me because he's, I think he wants to drool on me or something. <laughs> but look at the look that Louis has as he's looking at little Carrie. I mean, he's got, and she must be making a funny face at him, okay? And now Mike still has his hand inappropriately on his cousin, I mean, his sister, excuse me. Um, but Sally noticed something about this picture and that I never noticed. That my sister, if you look at her, she has a, in her mouth, it looks like a piece of licorice, red licorice. And I thought, well, that's, we've always seen that. But Sally noticed it goes all the way to the floor. It's like a four-foot piece of licorice. And I never noticed that before. And I only bring that up because this next picture you're about to see um, well, kind I think, of sums I think it up. there's a story here, and we've been trying to figure it out. But look at Dino's eyes, looking at the licorice, yeah, and watch what licorice. happens next. OK. Well, now the girls are having fun with Lewis. I'm sitting there in a goofy outfit with poodles on my suspenders. I've never gotten over it. And I thought I was just upset because I was dressed like this. But Sally figured it out. Look at my lips. They're red. I think I'm in a timeout. I think I stole my sister's licorice. So I'm sitting there punished while they're having fun with Lewis. And the guy behind him, I don't know who he is, but boy, he's laughing. He's thinking this is funny. And I'm not looking so good. Yeah, well, I, I know it couldn't have been a snowball because there are no snowballs in Las Vegas in 1960. But you got Lewis loving on those kids, which uh, uh, oh, he yeah. really did. So, okay, uh, I think we're going to change the mood a little bit. Well, let me say one thing oh, real quick. Okay, um, Just paraphrase, since I was so young, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I remember Lewis, man. No, I, I remember the aura about Lewis when he would come over to our house. And like with Liberace and some of the other people, it was different with Lewis. To me, I liken it to having Christmas morning and you're five years old and you're watching your parents act like five-year-old kids. You know, running around, just hustling around, and the, the hype in the house was just up there. It's elevated. So it was good memories and good times for everybody, I'm sure. Okay. Oh, boy. 
Uh, no, all right, now we'll get to the part where obviously Lewis has died. Um, this was a card that Louis, Lu, Lucille had sent to my father after he died, and obviously she sent a mass, put out, you know, they printed a lot of them, sent them all out. Um, obviously, like I told you before, my father loved Lewis like so many people did. Um, and he, she sent him this letter, I mean, she sent him this card because he sent her a letter uh, within days of Lewis dying. Okay. Okay, the letter reads, July 10th, 1971, it says, Dear Lucille, yesterday was the second saddest day in my life. The first being... Take it down. The first being that one five and a half years ago when I had to bury my brother Fred. I do pray along with the rest of my family that you, Lucille, can go on and be happy in life even though Lewis is no longer here. God, how I love that man and still do. He alone is the reason I play trumpet, sing, and try to entertain and make people happy as he did. My family and I send to you all our love, prayers, and oh yes, thanks. Thanks to you and God for keeping Lewis here to give us all the joy and love he did so unselfishly. Respectfully, Frank Asunto. Uh, like I said, you can tell just in the tone of that letter that what Lewis meant to my father. And I get a little choked because I'm going to tell you, I never saw my father cry. When his brother died, Jan's dad died, never saw him cry. My mother at the same time had experienced the first two of five brain tumor surgeries. Never saw him cry. I was in the room when he got the phone call that Lewis had died. And I saw my dad at the age of 13 when I was cry like nothing else. So he meant the world to my dad. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Dina. Well, there's a movie that came out in 1991. If you want to tell the story, the name of the uh, movie is Ramblin' Rose, and they actually used one of the cuts. The name, or the title, uh, title of the song is Dixie from the Lewis and the Dukes record as part of the soundtrack. So you want to set this up, and we'll yeah. go out with this? Yeah, we'll, we'll say goodbye with this one. Okay, this is almost a, a quasi-Betty story, another one. Uh, in the early 90s, Betty tells me, she says, you know, there's a movie, a Hollywood movie, big production. And they're playing the Duke's music. And they kind of name, the main theme, the main tune is, the, you know, Dixie. You know, she didn't, actually didn't know the tune. She said, that's one of the Duke's tunes. So I tell her, I ask her, I say, well, who's in the movie? I don't know. What's the name of the movie? I don't know. I don't remember. And I'm like, well, we didn't have Google back then, okay? So, so what do I do? I said, wait, a couple of years goes by, and she calls me up. She says, Dino, it's Rambling Rose, and it's, it's the, the main actress is Laura Dern, and her name is Rose in the movie, and they play the song Dixie as she swaggers down the main street of this little southern town. And I said, okay. And I, so I watched it, and she was right. But what she didn't know was that the version of Dixie was the one with Lewis on it, okay? And as I watched the whole movie, which was nice, and it's like, like I said, they played the whole tune, but, uh, which we're not going to do that here. But at the end of the movie, Robert Duvall says something that really points out a lot, I think. And I think we can all relate to it, and I think you, hopefully you will too. I know I did. Uh, he has to tell his now-grown son that Rose has died. Rose is no longer alive. And so we're going to watch this for a second. I think you'll catch it when Robert Duvall, you see him talking to his grown son, you'll catch it very quickly. I'll take him with me downtown. You too, Rose, if you want to ride. Sure, I'd love one. Thank you. 
was getting some attention. I think that was the purpose. Now here's where you'll listen to this now. Rose isn't dead, son, not really. Some of us die, some of us don't. Rose lives. <laughs> and I choose to believe so does Lewis. And that's why we come every year to celebrate his memory. I think he'd be happy with that. for sharing all these family treasures with us. <laughs> yeah, Jan, Jan Asunto you, Jan. in the office. And I want to thank Julius Evans, too, for helping with this PowerPoint presentation, all the tech support. Couldn't have been done without Julius, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks y'all for coming. Have a happy Satchmo Fest. Do you want to tell them I'll be available for questions? Oh, yeah. And Dino, will be out in the hall if you have questions. How about a hand for our great guests? And thank you for being so accommodating in the, uh, in the weather. Call me anytime. Hey, <laughs> Masters of Improvisation. I oh, think yeah, Lewis would. We got a captive crowd, you know. You couldn't go anywhere. There we go. There you go. Yeah, and I don't think you. It's rare that we have a personal uh, expose like that for, with all the pictures. Another hand for Mr. Saunders, please. All right, Dan. Yeah, he did great. All righty. Well, a couple more announcements. Um, <clears throat> do you have any uh, wares out there to sell? Many of our. 